Hey guys, Whitney here. Welcome to the Passive Investing Made Simple Masterclass. I'm your host, Whitney Elkins Hutton, Director of Investor Education here at PassiveInvesting.com. And I'm so excited for you to join me today. We do this uh, masterclass live every Tuesday so you can learn the ins and outs of passive investing. And uh, that way you can go into your next deal with confidence. And if you haven't done so already, check out PassiveInvestingWithWhitney.com. There, you can get priority access to our deals here at PassiveInvesting.com. You can also get some freebies from me on how to you know, get into your first or next uh, passive investment. Also, if you are interested in learning more and talking one-on-one -on, -one on how passive investing can actually help amplify the growth in your portfolio, uh, you can schedule time with me there. And of course, you get access to these free masterclasses, education sessions, and boot camp. Now today, I'm so excited to actually uh, you know, take some concepts that we've talked about before in various other masterclass sessions and thread them together to help you understand especially those of you who are transitioning close to retirement, exactly what do you need to do when you get seven to 10 years out from your theoretical retirement date? Like how exactly do you need to start looking at transitioning your portfolio, especially a passive real estate portfolio? Because passive real estate, as we all know, operates just very differently than the stock market. And while we love the passive real estate, we love the cash flow, we love the equity growth, we love the tax benefits, we need to also think about how do what are these changes in mindset, in our investment thesis, like, and how do we just execute on these shifts as we get closer to retirement? Now, before we launch into our topic today, if this is the first time you and I are meeting each other, welcome. Again, my name is Whitney Elkins Hutton, and this is the whole reason why I invest in real estate is so I can spend more time with my crazy crew that's pictured here and travel uh, and, and just create life experiences. And I started off real estate investing in 2002, um, living, flipping completely by accident. Uh, and then over the course of the past like 22 years now, I've scaled a, a rental real estate portfolio, have gotten into larger partnership deals on multifamily units, as well as been the general partner on over 10 projects and capital raised on over 35 projects. I've actually kind of lost count. So, um, but really all those, all those numbers are kind of vanity metrics, right? Um, really what passive investing in real estate in general has allowed me to do is to get 100% control and choice on how I spend my time. And those are the things that I'm teaching here, helping educate you on. That way you can repl replicate similar results in your portfolio. Now, uh, we can actually help you do that, you know, by actually deploying capital in equity assets and debt assets here at PassiveInvesting.com. You know, if you're watching this video live, we have over 264 million deployed in our note uh, fund. We also have 1.4 billion assets under management in all of our combined equity funds. And we have extremely strong returns to our limited partner investor, including over $51 million in distributions made. Now, guys, what we're talking about today here is about how do you transition your portfolio as you're getting ready for retirement? Okay. But this is, uh, well, I'm going to give you some tactical device uh, or advice or suggestions to chew on. This is not financial advice, legal advice, tax advice, okay? Take these concepts back to your investing team, your legal team, your tax team, your financial team, and make sure they fit for you in your particular investing plan, all right? Now, I am going to refer to other masterclass sessions that we've done even boot camp sessions that we've done before. Okay. Now, if you want to get access to these previous masterclass sessions and boot camps, as I refer back to them, make sure that you are joining at passive and with, excuse me, passive investing with Whitney.com. All right. So let's kick it off. Let transition in your portfolio. When you get seven to 10 years away from retirement, like what does this whole thing mean? Right? Well, let, let's think about these things that you need to consider when you get seven to 10 years away from retirement. Like as you, cause maybe, you know, you started investing in your twenties, 
um, maybe your thirties, you know, or maybe that's where you're at right now. in your investing, you know, phase you're in your accumulation phase. As we start getting closer to seven to 10 years within retirement, we need to start preparing, okay, for what that uh, mindset shift that that's going to occur. And really, it, it's not just about like, uh, you know, your, your traditional like growth mindset versus fixed mindset. We have to really, you know, um, understand what our investment thesis 2.0 or version two is going to look like. And so as we approach, you know, especially within seven to 10 years of retirement, we want to rethink what are our goals now? What kind of risk are we willing to take with our portfolio? What kind of timeline horizon do we have? Okay. You know, uh, you know, we're seven to 10 years out. Do we need to still, you know, take on some shorter momentum investments? Um, but also we need to start thinking for the long term. Like what is, you know, when we hit retirement, what's that next 25, 30 years going to look like? And then we need to understand our mindset, right? That's because, you know, we've been operating with one set of rules, one set of an investment thesis up until this point. We need to start prepping ourselves to transition to the next phase of life. Now, if you're joining me live on video, you can see here on the right hand side of the screen, I kind of put or I have a, a visualization of a, a, a capital stack there. And so, and I just put this here, uh, you know, to help people understand that, you know, essentially what you might consider doing is moving your investments from like, say, common equity, preferred equity positions that are closer to the top of the capital stack, okay, higher risk, higher reward, to creating a more foundational type of investment, lower risk, but potentially lower returns, but stabilized returns, and then getting in, you know, transitioning more to the debt side of things. Okay, that's just one way to visualize this. So what I, when I coach people that are uh, approaching retirement, essentially what we're looking to do in their kind of investment thesis 2.0 is to help them understand when is the appropriate time for them and also the appropriate balance for them to start trading equity and tax benefits or more assets that you know yield you know strict capital preservation and cash flow. How do we get them from the higher part of the capital stack, the high risk, high reward, down to a more foundational base, and make sure that that's really solid as they approach retirement? And why do we want to think about you know essentially adjusting you know the the allocation within our portfolio? Okay. Um, you know, and even if you're in stocks, bonds, and mutual fund, a similar thing occurs, right? You know, early in your investment and career, your, your advisor is probably saying, Hey, invest in more stocks, stocks and mutual funds, more equity type investments. And then the closer you get to retirement, you're ticking closer to more bonds, right? You're just exact, you know, shifting the scale of what your holdings are similar thing here. Um, it's just that we don't think of it stocks versus bonds. We think of it as equity versus debt. So why do we even want to think through this adjustment, you know, as you know, we approach retirement? Well, because your income needs are changing, right? Your paycheck is probably sunsetting, okay? But um, if you're going through a more traditional style of retirement, you might have a, a pension coming on board or social security or maybe a requirement required minimum distributions or other sort of retirement income coming into the picture. Okay, so your your again your income needs are changing here. Your risk tolerance is also changing, okay? And you as you approach retirement, it becomes more about not getting knocked out of the game, right? Warren Buffett's rule number 1 is don't lose money. Rule number two is see rule number one. What he means by this is that if you can maintain your actual capital investment, say you roll into retirement and you're invested and you have 5 million assets invested, ideally we want to continue to grow that 5 million assets. But if you just don't lose that 5 million, okay, you're not going to get knocked out of the game. You're still going to have a very comfortable retirement. But you have less time to recoup in case you did make a bad investment. Again, that's why we want to start thinking more about capital preservation here. Also, why do we want to think about um, this adjustment? Is that your time horizon level is changing? Okay, your portfolio now needs to last and 25, 30 years in retirement and produce stabilized income. Because right, we go back to step number one: your income needs are changing. And 
it will take at least one investment cycle, you know, to reposition your current portfolio. So, you know, for most of us, you know, historically that, you know, private equity, real estate investment cycle has been five to seven years. Well, if we hit a tough market, like we have in 2023, that, that cycle could actually be closer to seven to 10 years. So we want to start thinking about this in advance. So now that we understand what it is we're trying to do as we start approaching, you know, uh, retirement that we're essentially, um, starting to transition, maybe not all in one fail swoop, but over time, you know, moving for, towards capital preservation and cash flow focused assets, how do we actually start executing this? Well, first we have to understand where you are. Now guys, I'm gonna get into a lot of math. And if you're not joining me live on video, I will do my best to explain. But if you get lost in the math, um, if you're listening on your favorite podca podcast player of choice, go to passiveinvesting.com, dot is spelled out, D-O-T, on YouTube. And you can actually pick up this video and you'll get to see all the math walk through. You know, I walk through the math on the video with you. So first, like any goal that we're trying to line up, we need to know where we are, where we're going, what's the gap. Step one, where are we? Okay. So how, how you are going to be able to answer this question means that you must have been tracking your portfolio currently to date. Now, eight out of 10 investors I talked to on the phone are not adequately tracking their portfolio, right? At a minimum, you should be have all of your assets listed out and then Guys, this is tax preparation time right now in 2024. We're, we're discussing this in February 2024. This is a perfect time for you to list out all your investments that you're in, what asset class they are, who the operator is, what market are they um, in, and just you know some metrics about the deal. Like what is your you know uh, preferred return on that deal? What is your estimated IRR? Start tracking them. Now, the reason why we want to track this is that we want to understand your investment exposure, right? We don't know what you're currently exposed to right now between asset classes, type of deal, be it a debt deal or equity deal. We, we don't know your exposure by operator and by market. It's going to be really difficult for us to make some educated, um, an educated plan on how to make the shifts. Okay, so simple spreadsheet. And uh, last March in 2023, and I'll do it again here in 2024, later this year, I did a webinar, uh, actually a boot camp. that's what you're looking for, on how to set up your tracking process for your portfolio. We go deep dive in depth on that. But anyways, that's the first thing you want to do is track where you're at, all right? And the reason why we want to track where you're at is because we want to understand, again, that exposure, okay? What um, you know, do you already have rules in place? What's that investment thesis 101 version one you've been dealing with? What kind of asset class exposure have you had? What kind of exposure have you had to the various operators, markets, and deals? Now, we also want to start forward thinking, you know, that seven to 10 years before retirement, understanding, do you need to rearrange some of your risk here? Do you need to kind of take some chips off the table? Um, do you need to put some, shift your rules, right? Do you even have any rules, investing rules? Now, here's the thing. I, I, I really warn people, don't borrow other people's rules. Create these rules for yourself. But I will help you, um, you know, give an example of one of the rules that I abide by is that, you know, for me and my investing portfolio, I'm looking to have, you know, no more than between 10 to 15% allocated with any one operator and then no more allocated than 3% of my net worth in any one deal. Now that, but you got to come up with your own rules. Okay. So what's the litmus test on that rule? Well, for me, it's what helps me sweet sleep well at night. If the market were to go sideways and south, what would help me sleep well at night? Okay. If I knew, you know, an operator was having, um, you know, portfolio wide trouble, you know, what would help me sleep well at night? You know, if I had 75% of my portfolio with just one operator, that I probably wouldn't be sleeping well at night. Um, if I had invested more than 50% of my net worth in, in a deal, I probably would not be sleeping well at night. So create some of these rules for yourself, all right? So again, we gotta know where we're at. We gotta know what our, our portfolio is doing for us, okay, currently. And then we gotta know where we wanna go, 
Okay, where do you want to go in retirement? Do you want financial security? Is that what you're looking for? And, you know, do you, do you just simply need to have enough cash on hand to cover your expenses for one year? Okay, that's a pretty low bar. All right. But, you know, if you're just starting out and you're five years away from retirement, that is an amazing bar to, to try to ta take down in the next five years. All right. So write down what that number is for you, your annual security number. All right. What type of cash do you need on ha have on hand for one year? Um, to cover like your rent, your mortgage, your, your food, um, household expenses, utilities, transportation, all your insurances. Okay. This doesn't mean paying for family vacations or anything like that, but just like keeps the lights on food on the table in your house warm. You know, another milestone to think about as you move into retirement is like, okay, what do you need for financial vitality? This is everything that include that you would include in your financial security number. And then maybe some additional luxuries, like a little bit of clothing, a little bit of dining, and like a little bit of your small indulgences budget, okay? How much cash would you need on ha have on hand for one year to cover this milestone? Where most people are headed is they want to retire uh, at least at financial independence, meaning their investments generate enough cash flow to live their current quality of life adjusted for inflation without having to ever work again. Okay. This means they can add in clothing, small indulgences, go on family adventures, right? For most people, what this number would be what you're currently spending on a monthly basis right now. So again, if, if our steps are understand where we're at and where we want to go, okay, what is this number for you? Write down your annual financial independence number. What kind of money would you need to have? You're coming in in retirement to cover your independence. Now there's two levels past this. Okay, I'll just briefly introduce them to you because maybe some of you are striving for financial freedom where your gen investments generate enough cash to live your ideal lifestyle adjusted for inflation without ever having to work again. And maybe your ideal lifestyle includes a second home or a luxury car or a boat or just like amazing vacations every year, like safaris and stuff like that. What's that number? Okay. What, it, what would it take annually for you to have financial freedom? And then of course we've got the crude tile, which is your absolute financial freedom. Okay. This is where your assets are bringing in enough cash flow to do what you want, when you want, with whom you want, without ever having to work again, you know, and for people like Tony Robbins, you know, who, who coined this concept, they're thinking in terms of planes, islands, sport franchises. But if that is what you're wishing for in retirement, write down that number, okay? All right, so step one, we gotta know where we're at. Step two, we have to know where we're going. Step three, we need to calculate the gap that we have to close. Now, we're gonna backtrack just a teeny bit because we need to understand your total estimated annual cash flow number. So for those of you, you know, if you're approaching retirement, you have to consider that you might have other additional streams of income coming in. So you're going to take what you're currently, you know, remember in step one, you've tracked your portfolio. What is your portfolio currently bringing in annually for you cash flow wise? All right. And then in retirement, what other streams of income are you projected to bring in? And other streams of income can look like pensions, annuity, maybe you have life insurance policies that you're going to draw income off of. Maybe you have required minimum distributions from your Ross, your IRAs. Maybe you have some other uh, holdings that are throwing off dividends, like your stocks and your bonds and your taxable account. And then maybe you're considering to continue to work during retirement. Maybe you have a business that's throwing off some passive income, or maybe you're employed. Okay, you want to add up all these income sources that you have available to you in retirement. And you really want to get very crystal clear on what you can expect there, right? Because this is where the math, this is where the rubber meets the road. Okay, we need to know where you're at, where you're going, and what that gap is. What's the difference? So we just walked you through all the different, where you could go, all those different life, uh, uh, milestones along that financial independence and financial freedom journey. Okay. And I want you to calculate 
you know, take that annual security, financial security number and back out your estimated annual income. Okay. You probably have already far exceeded your annual security number. Many of you have already exceeded your annual vitality number. Many people, as they get closer to retirement, are closing in on that financial independence number. What is your annual independence um, income that you need to have uh, coming in? Back out your estimated annual cash flow. And that's the, the delta, the gap that you need to close. All right. And then just for fun, add in your annual freedom number, like find out what that gap is. Okay. Maybe you've already sailed right past your annual financial independence numbers and you're on to financial freedom. Also take note on how long you have until you retire. Okay. Write that, that, that uh, time horizon number down. Again, if we can quantify this, this makes uh, getting there uh, simpler. Okay, because not necessarily easier, guys, but simpler. All right. So we step one, where are we? Step two, where do we want to go? Step three, what's the gap? Step four, let's start making some shifts here. Let's start planning for some shifts. Now, there's uh, some low hanging fruit, right? We want to look at our current portfolio and be like, okay, can we do better with what we currently have? Well, there's a number that I always, um, you know, look and look for in my portfolios. It's called um, the investment index number. And essentially what I do with all my investments, I look at what I initially invested in the deal. And then I divide it by the monthly net return I can anticipate for the deal. Now you can do it one of two ways. Okay. You can do it your monthly cash flow. Okay. But I like taking the total expected net return, annual return that I'm expected to get and divide it there and get uh, an index number. Why is that? Because um, if you're involved in passive real estate, you, you're going to have like your small cash flow coming in right now. And then you're going to have a larger equity chunk at the end whenever it um, the asset cycles out. Okay. So we want to take that uh, realistic total net return that we are to expect at the end, and we, we get an index number. The lower this index number, the better. So I aim to be 75 or below, okay? For assets that are like right in that 75 range or higher, okay, this helps me identify some lazy assets in my portfolio. And quite frankly, most people are gonna take a look at the cash sitting in the bank, and they're gonna be like, uh-oh, <laughs> the investment index on this is like almost zilch. It's like up in the 200s, 300s, 600s, all right? So this, again, what this investment index number really helps us do is to objectively optimize your assets, okay? You're gonna identify some lazy cash sitting there that you need to get invested, okay? You you might identify some assets, uh, you know, that, you know, that have no prayer of cycling out. And that should be, you know, you should work with your tax team to book them as losses. Okay, I know several operators that have walked away from assets over the past 12 to 24 months, okay? Um, maybe you need to just look at the, calculate the investment index across your portfolio and then optimize your current investments. Maybe you have some properties that you're trying to, Figure out, do I need to sell them? Should I refinance them? You know, can I realistically push rents on these um, in order to get a better investment index, all right? But the whole point here with this, you know, calculation uh, and redeployment plan is to figure out how can you reallocate your current capital into your new investment thesis as you re approach retirement. What is there? What is some low hanging fruit that you should, you know, really, uh, to you know, dive in and figure out how to re redeploy, okay? But there's a, a few other things that you should consider too, right? Because it's not all about optimization. Remember the seven to 10 years um, before retirement, we're looking to redeploy into, again, that new investment thesis, the one that takes into account our new goals, our new risk tolerance and our new timeline, okay? So, we're gonna, you know, the slide before really helped you identify like kind of some lazy things that you should could work on optimizing now. But as your investment cycle out, okay, you need to think about: Do you, are you gonna redeploy all or part of that cycling asset into a new investment thesis? Okay, so you, if you're approaching retirement, you may be 
um, you know, posed with a question, hey, do you want to do a 1031 exchange? Okay, if that asset is the first time you're doing a 1031 exchange, um, then you may want to kind of, you know, sit down with your tax strategist and do some, you know, calculations here. Does it make sense to actually do what we call a lazy 1031 exchange and take some of that money and put it into more cash flowing capital preservation assets like a, you know, our real estate debt fund, right? That gives you monthly cash flow and then take the other part of it and continue to invest it in equity deals, right? These are just some ideas here. Uh, number two, you're going to want to consider, especially the closer you get to that retirement date, creating a liquid note ladder of assets. So setting aside one to three years uh, in cash in a liquid environment, like a note fund, okay? This will help you smooth the road and not have to draw down your portfolio in poor markets, right? You know, if you've got one to two years of cash sitting on hand or in, you know, liquid um, note funds that are backed by a hard asset like real estate, that is something that you can draw on to help you, uh, you know, smooth the cash flow ride and not have to, you know, liquidate um, some assets in potential uh, down markets. And then number three, if you have a lot of funds sitting in retirement accounts, uh, and if you're going to be projected to retire with more than, say, $500,000 in your retirement account, then talk to a tax strategist about Roth conversions in your, in your IRAs. Okay, so how could you actually use this uh, ramp up time towards retirement to move, uh, pay some of the tax bill and get that moved over now? That way you're not triggering things like provisional income, which can cause a do double taxation on your social security. Okay, this is getting into like 303 finances. Um, so you really want to talk to a tax strategist to figure out what is the best course of action for you and when you should start making those types of shifts. All right, guys, we talked a lot about these types of shifts um, that we covered here in my new book uh, with Bigger Pockets, Money for Tomorrow, How to Build and Protect Generational Wealth. Um, Pre-orders are still available. It does. Um, it fully launches on the 22nd here in a couple of days. So go to biggerpockets.com forward slash money for tomorrow if you want to dig into more topics like this. And then, and then again, you need to visit passiveinvestingwithwhitney.com. Make sure that you're plugged in there because again, we have the opportunity to hop on a one-on-one -on -one call and help you understand how equity and debt investments, especially in passive real estate, can help you achieve your goals in retirement. And we'll do, we'll be doing more educational classes like this, helping you prepare for your upcoming retirement.